ena mana, ena iwi, ena waka, e rakatira mā, tihei Māori ora. Ko Peter Chris Pahau, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tata katoa. Uh, that's just a very brief uh, greeting in which I uh, acknowledge your journey here, your waka, the way you arrived here and where you've come from. Uh, I acknowledge your iwi and your family, and wasn't that just amazing to hear all these stories sort of percolating out from amongst us, get a sense of the feeling of the roots, the tentacles of our, of our existence. So I recognise that, and I recognise your mana, which is your core and your strength of, of who you are. Can see all the Kiwis in the audience nodding away, um, and Tihe Modi Ora, which is uh, I, I breathe life and I acknowledge the life force that is here today. And then Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Tata Kato means I welcome you here, I welcome you here, and I welcome you all here today. So it can go on a lot longer than that, believe me. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, it is really amazing being here today and being part of this gathering. There's quite a little buzz happening down in the down in Wellington there about this gathering up here. Like, what's what all these crazy people doing gathered up here in the hills? So <laughs> what can they possibly be talking about? And where have they come from? It's really quite cool. So I've had lots of texts and emails over the weekend about what's going on up in Whiteman's Valley. So Whiteman's Valley was like sort of just a valley, but now it's you know it's really got a cool place on the map. So. Um, just congratulations to you all for being here and for trying to do something and for having some sort of adventure. So, um, look, my job here today, uh, nothing minor really, is to sort of just go through what the New Zealand story is. And before I do that, I just want to um, just to give you a very tiny, quick uh, cameo on New Zealand history. And I'm going to cut a lot of corners. And for the Kiwis in the room who actually know the history, Peter and people like that, you, you'll know the bits that I'm cutting off. Um, but I think to the understand the story of New Zealand, you have to understand the history. And so, you know, 1,300 years ago, there was nothing here but birds. Uh, this was really the last chunk of land uh, that was like that. It was just birds, no mammals, just birds. Pretty amazing. And then um, about 800 years ago, uh, seven waka or canoe uh, did this absolutely amazing massive migration uh, from the Pacific Islands, from Hawaii. Uh, Tahiti uh, down here and landed in different parts uh, of New Zealand across uh, you know, quite a long period of time. And in so doing, established the basic tribal roots uh, of New Zealand that are still very strong and very important today. Māori then uh, lived here for quite a considerable period of time, uh, an amazing way of life. Um, then about 250 years ago, uh, Captain Cook uh, arrived uh, just beat a whole lot of other countries. France was just there, the Netherlands were just there, but he happened to be the one that poked the flag in the, in the bit of dirt in Gisborne, where I'm from, actually. Um, and then about uh, 150 years ago, there were successive waves of uh, uh, European uh, migration, just that pattern of uh, colonisation that was happening uh, all over the world, and fundamentally uh, changed the very structure and nature of the society, uh, there was a considerable amount of wars, there was disease, pestilence, disease, uh, almost wiped Māori out. But the, fortunately for Māori, it's a warrior culture, it's deeply resilient, highly creative and ingenious. Uh, they, the British never beat them. So, um, and so ultimately that resulted in a treaty being signed, Treaty of Waitangi, that is to this day the foundation stone uh, of this nation. Then... Uh, so then the, the colonists sort of you know, cleared the land, um, uh, developed quite big farms, uh, and really it was solving the European, or more particularly the British, problem of supply of food. So we became pretty much a, a farm for uh, the UK uh, and to Australia, who were a net importer of food over that period. So that happened over a period of time um, until we got to uh, the, in 1972, when uh, the European Union was formed and we got locked out of the European Union. Uh, at that point in time, we were number six uh, wealth per uh, capita or wealth per person in New Zealand, in the world. Uh, we quickly plummeted over a period of time down to mid-1980s to number 22, uh, as we just got locked out and we left with all this highly subsidised, highly regulated commodity production that was going nowhere. Butter mountains and the whole works, meat mountains and so forth. So it was a disaster. In 1984, we then uh, set about the most uh, quick and savage 
period of deregulation probably the world has ever seen, only possible because it was a very small country. And we deregulated, took away the import uh, licenses, uh, deregulated the dollar, stripped off all the uh, subsidies off the farmers. Uh, we lost about a third uh, of New Zealand's manufacturing, lost all the car plants, all the clothing, uh, and the farming completely changed overnight. Um, and that was um, savage, but pretty much ultimately uh, uh, the path we had was to really, if we're going to exist in this world, we can only exist really being internationally competitive. That was a common understanding. So we stripped away the deregulation and or the regulation. So now pretty much as you look around New Zealand, there's nothing here that can't compete uh, internationally because that's, that's the type of laissez-faire economy that it now is. So where we've got to now is... Um, uh, quite well governed, uh, quite low growth, 2 to 3% growth. They call it a rock star in the OECD, but it probably says you more about the OECD than it does about New Zealand. But, um, but a, a lot of entrepreneurialism, quite a strong startup ecosystem. There's quite a bit of, of life here, but in many other ways, it's struggling with us being a long way away from the rest of the world and struggle, struggle with uh, scale as well. It's only 4.5 million people here. Just the last um, chapter of the story, I think, is the uh, you know throughout the 1960s and on the successive waves of migration from the Pacific Islands and from Asia. So now you're also looking at a laissez-faire, sort of well-governed but highly diverse population. Uh, Auckland is now the second most diverse city in the world. Uh, and that profile of diversity is getting uh, richer and richer and richer. The interesting thing about the public sentiment towards that diversity is it's mostly positive. So the uh, surveying they've done in Auckland recently about that says that this is a country that actually not only likes that diversity but would like more of it. And a huge part of that is because coming back to that treaty and that bicultural heritage, we have learnt to to accommodate and, and uh, work within a couple of big cultures, and then that gives the basis on which we can diversify the country. So that's a very, very quick um, history lesson. Um, and sorry for all those people in the room that I've, I've offended, I've cut, cut bits off, but I think it's important to, to sort of see that history as we go about um, telling the New Zealand story. So, that word says authenticity. So. What happened was a couple of years ago, um, the Prime Minister came to a few of us and said, look, can we tell a, a bit bigger story about New Zealand? We had 100% pure, which you might have heard about that. That's our sort of tourism brand. Uh, there was nothing wrong with it. Uh, it was highly popular. We spent millions on it. Uh, but it was really sort of, it says New Zealand's clean and green, but that's it. We knew there's a lot, lot more to New Zealand than just being clean and green. There was nothing wrong with it, but it was a very incomplete uh, story. So we set about to start, try and distill a broader story about New Zealand. So we got together a couple of hundred people from a range of organisations, from companies, from entrepreneurs, from Māori, from people overseas, uh, government, bureaucrats, lots of different people, and, and a rich sort of uh, cauldron of activity uh, and a design-led workshop over the course of a year, and distilled out what the sort of core essence and character of New Zealand is. And then from that, we had to try and weave some sort of story, and that's what I want to share with you today. So we found uh, three basic characters. We call them integrity, uh, kaitiaki, and resourcefulness. So integrity, I'll just pause and let you read those words for a minute. So the point here is that there's something about the way of life here which is a high integrity setting. Now you see it, um, you see it in all the indices uh, like corruption and you know uh, places to business and just the predictability and the trustworthiness of the settings. And you see it in the human rights, uh, you know the development index, where to be born index, all this sort of stuff says that there's something about the sort of fabric of the nation that's quite high integrity. But you know when to me, it's, it's a lot deeper than that. And if you go back over the history, we've got some pretty amazing things about the country. First place to give women the vote, okay? Um, the way that we stood up against the Americans, no disrespect to the Americans in the audience, I'm sure it wasn't you, uh, but when the USS Truxton, you know, um, uh, 
came into Wellington Harbour and we were out there in our canoes uh, pushing away this massive great warship as a protest against the, uh, nuclear, one of the nuclear free Pacific basically. That was very staunch uh, position. Uh, it cost us massively in terms of our foreign relations and our trade. We made an enemy, not for life as it turned out because we're sort of back in the fold again, but we were pushed out into the cold for at least 30 years for that. Um, if you look at our, our position on apartheid, um, you know, we were one of the first uh, Western nations to come out strongly against apartheid, and it, it really touched the fabric of the country because rugby is part of the core sort of essence, and I'm not talking about the sport, I'm talking about the culture of rugby and rugby league, I'll give my brother a heads up there. Um, but the warrior culture that's embedded in, inside rugby, a very important part um, of, of who we are. And so for us to oppose South Africa, who was another big, proud rugby nation, was a very important uh, sort of step and, and position against that. So, you know, first welfare state in the world. Um, so there were lots of different things about what was happening in New Zealand which showed there was some sort of essence of governance uh, that's, that went across party, uh, went across people, it went across cultures. There's something about being on a small island on the edge of the South Pacific that wanted to be governed well, and I guess human rights was right on the very heart of that. So the second thing is this thing we call kaitiaki. And it is about uh, the relationship uh, with the land and the sea. It's a Māori word. We couldn't find another word that was as good as kaitiaki. Uh, and it's not, just, it's not just we like the environment, it's much, much deeper. It's about people's relationship to the land and to the sea and to each other. And the look at how we embrace and look after the land and the sea and the air and each other. Uh, it's a very deep uh, concept. Interestingly, when we um, did this research and then we took it out overseas, um, uh, we found that people overseas really related to the word once we explained it to them. Uh, and it really was hard to find another word. It's still a very hard thing to explain, but I'll just give you a, um, an image. Uh, this is, this is uh, Mount Nicholas uh, Station, High Country Sheep Station, down past in the Otago, um, where they make uh, uh, New Zealand merino wool. Uh, there's two words there, whenua. Uh, whenua is the land. Uh, but in, inside that word whenua is your relationship to the land as well. And Māori, which is the life force, uh, the life force that surrounds the land and surrounds us. Both Māori words, very, very powerful words in their own right. Why have I chosen Mount Nicholas Station? And why have I got a picture of a drone there? <laughs> because I think it's just understanding the highly contemporary nature of these ideas. These are ancient ideas, but highly contemporary ideas as well. So Mount Nicholas Station is the biggest single supplier for um, Icebreaker. Does anyone know Icebreaker in the room? It's a clothing company. There are probably a lot of people in the room wearing Icebreaker. The great thing about Icebreaker is it's, it's highly designed um, and it commands a premium in the market. So it's not a commodity style production, it's a premium value add production. Uh, and part of the attraction of Icebreaker for people who buy it is the full track and trace traceability right back to the source. So when they trace Icebacker back to the source, they get to Mount Nicholas Station, that place there. So you look at Mount Nicholas Station, uh, there's four generations of farming family, uh, and they have got a very strong relationship with the whenua, with the land. And they, the way they farm that land, the sustainability of their farming has lasted four generations. If you talk to them about their farming, as we did last week, they are farming to look after not the next generation, but the one after because that is the, is the rate that you can either degrade or enhance the land. So overgrazing is a, is a very, very important one. They have droughts, so you know, being able to understand what drought conditions are like, offload stock off the land before the drought gets too bad so you preserve the land. So these are very important things, and are increasingly part of the sustainability, and I suspect this is why some of the entrepreneurs are here, a big part of the sustainability story in New Zealand now is the application of technology to these primary uh, production in order to climb these value chains and go premium. So the drone is going to have a big influence on New Zealand farming, there's absolutely no doubt about it, um, as has GPS tracking. So we can now apply a fertiliser, and it's very basic, so the fertiliser trucks, uh, well the path of the fertiliser truck doesn't overlap uh, when it fertilises the land. Uh, because of the GPS tracking. So that for you're getting 20% efficiency by butting up those fertiliser tracks against each other. You're not over-fertilising the land. When you're not over-fertilising the land, you're stopping that nutrient leaching, or at least making it less. So some of New Zealand's biggest challenges now are around these issues, you know, where, as I said early on, understanding the history, we grew up 
uh, making commodities. So when you grow up making commodities, you can stress the land a lot. Uh, we have now hit the environmental constraint of the land, so that we have got no choice but to climb these value chains and go premium, and technology is our friend as we, as we do that. So kaitiaki, this deep relationship to the land, this multi-generational long-term custodianship of the land and the sea and the air and the people. Final one is resourcefulness, and it's about uh, creativity and ingenuity and the way people think. So this is, um, this is a graph, I actually got this at Stanford, so it must be right. So it <laughs> came from the heart of all knowledge, didn't it? So I'm not sure whether you can see that on the screen, but well, it's got two continuums there. One is small power distance to large power distance. One is individualism to collectivism. The, la the power distance one is the interesting one here. Uh, that's about hierarchy, people's attitude to hierarchy. So you see there that New Zealand, uh, very close to Denmark, someone here was from Denmark, someone, yeah, there you go, from Denmark, you're like us, very low hierarchy. So in New Zealand, there's not, you know, you don't, seniority is not a big thing, we don't use the word senior, we don't really sort of doth your clap, and it goes right, right back to, you know, when the, particularly when the um, New Zealand got colonised, the, the British that came out here were escaping the class system. That's a bit to do with it, so the bit of that is an attitudinal sort of, um, uh, indifference to uh, hierarchy, but also there's more than that because I think it's part of being in a small island out on the edge of the Pacific um, uh, with a sh very strong practical backbone to it is that, you know, what really matters is, is whose ideas they are, oh, sorry, what ideas they are, not whose ideas they are. So the application of your hands creatively in a low hierarchy setting uh, gives you this ingenuity. And that, if you talk to someone like James Cameron about why he came to make movies down in New Zealand, it wasn't because it's clean and green and nice looking environment, because there's nice looking environments all over the world. You all have seen beautiful environments, because it's the cre creativity, the low hierarchy, and the ability to be ingenious uh, in this environment. So we think that's a really uh, interesting setting. Uh, quite interesting, as you look at, like, if you go to an IT startup in New Zealand, a lot of it is. Um, it's like the United Nations, it's very, very multicultural because a lot of these people have come from overseas to work in these IT startups, but they're still able to work and function extremely effectively in a low hierarchy setting. So it's not just about the sort of about your heritage, it's something about something in the water here that delivers a low hierarchy. And we think we're starting to understand it, and it's very, very important to us. So that's um, We've been stuffing around with, here's a group called IDEO who, um, who work out of Silicon Valley, a design shop, and they've been working with us a bit in our country story. And this is a concept that we've sort of come up with, and there's two, two Māori words. One is iti. Iti means small and precious and fast and adaptable. Nui means large and mass and scale. The interesting thing is that if you think about paradigms and how paradigms change, paradigms often innovate uh, not from the edge and the core of the, uh, sorry, not from the middle and the core of the paradigm, but from the edge of the paradigm. It's often small things that actually involves in paradigms revolving. And Thomas Kuhn, when he wrote the book uh, called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he said that, that paradigms don't evolve, they revolve. They revolve, and so the relationship of things small to things large is very, very powerful. So iti nui, iti transforms nui. And so we're like classic itty. So we're out here, edge of the Pacific, low hierarchy, anything goes. You can think what you like to think. There's strong human rights, so there's a lot of itty going on. So you get a lot of spontaneous innovation. You get the first welfare state. You get women the right to vote. You get daylight saving. You get all this sort of stuff comes out because of those types of underpinning cultural settings. So, but you know, when you've got a country story, you can't, you can't take that long to explain it, can you? So you've got to find a way to, um, and, and we work to try and find, what's a way that we can uh, uh, crystallise these underlying um, ideas? And the thing about these ideas is that we do, we do know them and understand them to be true. And when it comes to country stories, and we've done a lot of work with a guy called Simon Anholt, who's the world's leading expert on country branding. And what he says is that you can't, have a story that you want to be, you have to have a story that you are. So all you can do is hope to shine a light on who you are in a way that people can understand it. So, um, so the whole idea is that, that what we try to do is to 
to peel back the authenticity of the story and then find a storytelling mechanism that was going to expand on the story. So we, um, uh, we came up with this, open spaces, open hearts, open minds, and you can see the three parallels with the integrity and the kaitiaki and the resourcefulness. And then we sort of build up some collateral, one of which is a video that I want to show you now. Welcome to the country of open spaces. Where nature bursts and flows. Where the elements come alive. Where there is room to breathe and places to find. Welcome to the country of open hearts. Where care for the land and people is genuine. Where trust forms lasting partnerships. Where strangers are treated as friends. And memories are treasured forever. Welcome to the country of open minds. Where learning is embraced. And opinions valued. Where nature inspires incredible thinking. Where ingenuity drives design and innovation. Where big ideas are born every day. And new technologies are perfected. Where the impossible becomes real. Where every sunrise inspires the extraordinary. Welcome to the country of open spaces, open hearts, and open minds. Together, we can do amazing things. You can, uh, you can see the threads of what I was talking about running through that story, can't you? So, you know, I guess it's, it's no mystery, really. So um, it's a young country, um, you know, rounded out, 1,000 years old, out on the edge, very small, able to establish a fair, fairly high integrity way of life, uh, with low hierarchy, uh, bounding with creativity and ideas. So the question for us is what can we actually do with the place? So... The last thing I just want to take a bit, and this is not a pitch for the flag. We're having a big, we're having a big uh, post-colonial debate about our flag at the moment. It's really, really interesting. Um, so, but just a bit about the fern, because what people don't know, and I'm not making a pitch for the flag. This is um, what people don't know is really the story behind the fern. There's two stories behind the fern. Um, one of them is um, when Maori were going through the bush, often uh, at night, raids and so forth. They were, it's a silver fern, it's got a silver underside, so they'd break it over in the bush. Uh, and then you could, the light, the moon or the light would catch the underside of the, of the fern, and that's a way of seeing your way through the bush. So they go out and they break off, and as they come back, they can follow their own path back. So the fern is, is a sign of a pathfinder, uh, a way forward, a, a true north, a compass. The second meaning of the fern, and this is the reason why the All Blacks have got the fern on their chest, and why the Maori Battalion... Uh, have got had the they fought under the fern as well, and the reason for that is that there's a, a Maori saying that says uh, when one warrior dies, another one rises to take its place, and it refers to how a fern grows. So it is like it's a palm, so it grows out from the middle, it unfolds into a koru, 
and it falls over and dies away. But as it's doing that, it's unfolding and, and growing and renewing itself all the time. But when one fern dies, another one is rising to take its place. When one warrior rises, another one, uh, another, one warrior dies, another one rises to take its place. So it's a, it's a sign of, of resilience. It's like, so when you're playing rugby or rugby league, you know, when one person gets tackled and goes down, another one there is to take, take his place. So that, that's how it should work. So that's the symbol. Um, and quite incredible. The fern, fern's gone quite viral now. It's sort of, um, it's all over the place. We're not sure what's going to happen to our, our national flag, but I think the point about the, the, why we're talking about the flag now, it's because we are entering a post-colonial New Zealand, and, and New Zealand's probably got the claim to be the most successful post-colonial uh, positioning in the world today. Now that doesn't, but don't have two rose-tinted spectacles. We've got a lot of issues out there. We've got enormous, uh, we've got some really rugged regional uh, poverty. Uh, we've got employment issues, uh, youth unemployment in certain parts of the country. We've got quite a few issues, but if you, if you, if you kind of stand back and just look at the overall setting, it is a, a relatively successful post-colonial uh, positioning. So the question now is what does that mean for us as a people and our future and what we're trying to create and form together? And I guess coming right back to you here, you know, we, are, we are reaching out now. So who, who can we work with? How can we work with these crazy Monaghan brothers that have turned up and want to do something with, with the country? I mean, that's very exciting for us. How do we make these partnerships? How can we work with people? What can we create together? Norera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tata katoa. Thank you very much, Peter. That was a great talk. Um, and as a proud Kiwi, really impressed and congratulate you and New Zealand Trade and Enterprise for the amount of synthesis um, and distillation on the New Zealand story that you've done. We had a digital media day here yesterday and part of what came out about what makes a good story is that authenticity, that connection to the truth um, of, of where we are and so it was really nice to see that reflected in the story and the good work that you've been doing at New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. So we've got about 15 minutes now for contributions, reflections, potential questions, um, and I understand that you've got time for that before you, before yeah, you depart. Yeah. And I guess for me, I mean, and the reason I came out here today was the question for me is how can we, what can we do together? How can we work together? What can we create together? Um, and what are the next steps in that creation? That's a, I'm not sure whether we can crack that open in 15 minutes ac across the whole well, group, but that's, that's the question I've got. Yeah, how can we create something together? That's my question. Well, that's a, that's a great question to kick off. So perhaps um, if anyone's got some reflections or some initial response to Peter's question, then, then that would be great. I'll just hey, thanks for coming in today, and, and thank you for that presentation. I, I think you really were spot on in, in sort of a lot of the... Uh, conclusions that you made around storytelling and um, the sort of authenticity especially really spoke to me. Um, you know, in sort of the question that you pose around, okay, so uh, where to from here? How to move forward? Mm. How can we actually, you know, build this vision that, yeah. that is shared by so many Kiwis? And that's one thing that we really notice is we talk to a lot of people. This is a, a shared story uh, amongst a lot of people even before sort of the solidification into these mm. terms. Uh, you know, and then to sort of riff off of the shadow side, it, it does seem to me that um, the opportunity to move forward integrates both the uh, kaitakiaki, you maybe got that wrong. That's pretty uh, close, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Uh, with the economic yeah. development. You know, this, this sort of trade off between, oh, well, the dairy cows are great because they bring in a bunch of foreign exchange money, but they're polluting the waterways. And yeah. so there's this sort of like, Either yeah. or, do we have the natural environment yeah. or do we yeah. have the economic opportunities? Um, you know, sort of using the advantage that comes from technology and the really smart people in New Zealand, um, it seems to me that there's a, you know, sort of a third way that integrates the both of them that leverages the great advantage that already exists in New Zealand's primary sector, that leverages the low population density and beautiful farmland um, with sort of education and technology in the future um, to both... Um, regenerate New Zealand's natural ecology, 
boost the primary sector and create a whole new export stream of technologies. Because as you said, New Zealand's not the only place to be facing these issues. Mm. Uh, globally, yeah, these yeah, issues are yeah. faced. How do we create a food system that you know lives within the bounds of our ecological confines? Um, that question, if solved in New Zealand, is a, is a billion dollar economic activity. Mm. And it does seem to me that New Zealand is actually uh, leading and has a really great opportunity to be out in front in that growing industry. And it's an industry that, you know, like where we come from in Silicon Valley just isn't getting attention. And so it's a massive, fast growing, neglected part of the global mm. economy. And I think it leverages a lot of what New Zealand's great at. So just to kind of bring that up, that, that I don't think that the, um, we don't, I don't think we have to choose between ecological health and economic prosperity. Um, I think that it's possible to have both. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> no, look, totally. And I think that third way is is the new paradigm, if you like. And, and that was, I guess, we, last week, the exercise I was involved with, we took 20 primary sector chief executives. Uh, when I say primary sector, they're running primary sector companies in New Zealand, some of the biggest ones, uh, and 20 Māori leaders down to Mount Nicholas Station. We went to Mount Nicholas because the only reason that Mount Nicholas Station is getting a, a, a premium for the for the produce that's coming off that farm is because of the sustainability yeah so that's the whole point so so you know consumers are saying they want fully track and traceable uh, products and services that are uh, that recognize and protect the environment uh, so that's part of it that's why icebreaker can charge more for those products. They have to be a bloody good product as well, by the way. They can't just be a sustainability story. But track and trace um, and full sustainability stories behind your products are the third way. And that actually kind of joins everything together. But yeah, really, uh, in some ways, with those primary sector leaders, if you, if you talk to them, um, there is um, ingenious paradigm shifting edges in lots of our companies. So, so that's, yeah, for us now, we are those edges, that those paradigm breaking edges that we need to foster and grow and accelerate. And, and really the thing, the thing, the biggest single thing we're missing with this is good, strong economic and business models that do, as you say, join up to that third way. What are those business models that sit there? Who's going to actually make money out of that? Because it is a laissez-faire economy. If people aren't going to make money out of that, joining up of sustainability in the economy, then, then yeah, ultimately it'll, it'll stay in the teepee. Yep. Well, as a sustainability strategist, that's just music to my ears, always looking for ways to get beneficial outcomes for people, planet, profit. So delighted to hear that. So we've got time for one more reflection from Ariel here. And I know that this may be controversial given New Zealand's policies at the moment, but what about replacing some dairy farms with hemp farms and being an export of hemp products for so many levels? And I'm not talking medical marijuana, yeah. um, but on so many levels, paper, toilet paper, the omega-3s food product um, exporting to the U.S. All the hippies would go crazy and love it. Um, so that's one idea. And another piece, tagging onto what Brian was sharing, I feel like economic stability and thriving in the future requires ecological. They, they, they can't yeah. be separated anymore. Yeah. So that is the smartest thing we can do economically here is to invest in, into the ecology. And another aspect, I see the time we're living in now as a modern renaissance. And so in any re renaissance, as the technological... Uh, innovation advances, so do the arts. And so I could see, and it's already happening in this valley, that masterful artists are coming and taking up residency here and producing their art. Oh. And so I could see positioning New Zealand in creative ways of really incentivizing masterful artists to come here and being a leading country um, in, in, in that aspect of the Renaissance as well. We know that da Vinci was not only a phenomenal artist, but a sniper and a scientist. So I want yeah. to really present um, the opportunity for New Zealand to invest in the arts. Yep. Oh, and the last one, absolutely. I mean, that relationship between art and poetry and business and creativity is just a nexus, isn't it? I mean, it's just an ecosystem of... Of, of infectious sort of cross-collaboration, if you like, and that, if you look in the Miramar Peninsula where Lord of the Rings have come out, it's full of artists and, 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 and people who think uh, in a different way and along a different track. Um, just coming back to your thing about hemp, if someone can make money out of growing hemp and it's legal, they, they go for it, they should go for it. But the question is, what's the economic model? What's the business model that can do it? And 
And of course we have to solve the ecological problems in order to go forward, but just put yourself in a position of someone who owns a big commodity production, a business that's making you know $3 billion turnover, or something like that, not, it's not very big. Uh, they've got these big assets, these big factories. And then with these factories, they've got massive fixed costs, you have to feed them. You have to feed them with stock and you have to push carcasses out the other end and they all go off to China. So that's, and there are banks lined up and there are investors lined up. Uh, that is the nexus that you're trying to break. And everybody in that whole system can have a fantastic attitude towards the environment, but it's the structural economics of having to feed those big fixed assets that really is at the heart of the whole, that is at the heart of the paradigm. If you can break that, you can break a lot. This is really awesome discussion and, and reflection, so we're just going to uh, allow a bit more time for That's a right, couple we got more time. questions. Got <laughs> We've got you up there now. Oh, so. give, this, give this guy, so, this guy here is going to burst if you don't give him a question. Uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> Did you want to give me a for lunch? Uh, I've, got, I've got a presentation at one o'clock in the city, so i probably go out, I've got to go out about six or seven minutes. Did you, this is fun though, this is cool. By the way, there's a lot of other Kiwis in the audience. So, Reese and other people, you can answer some of these bloody questions as well. Hey, bro. I love the presentation. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I'm just curious what your perspective is on um, the potential tarnishing of our green, green, green and, uh, sorry, green, 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 green image um, as a result of the mining and the deep sea oil that's come about in the recent, you know, it's, it's a thing now. I don't know if it's kicked off entirely yet, but it's, it's seriously on the cards. I'm just curious what your perspective might be. Yeah, on. I lived in Norway for four years, um, and they got the North Sea, and they do a lot of mining. So I think the question is nothing wrong with the mine. Uh, it's probably not very popular in this room. But there's nothing wrong with the mine, and there's nothing wrong with uh, with drilling for oil and gas. I, I'm less. I mean, it's uh, for a lot of this economic activity. It's not the economic activity itself. It's how you do it. So, and the big thing about for us uh, for. Um, Drilling in New Zealand, I think simple things like have we got a big rescue vehicle uh, available, which is a massive investment for the government. So if we're going to have that deep sea drilling, if we've got a vehicle uh, like a ship, like a proper rescue ship that can front up in a nanosecond, or do we have to wait for it to come down from Florida or something like that? So I think it's the conditions that matter and the rules around it and how it gets done. But Norway is a beautiful, clean and green, green country. And it's, <laughs> made, it's made its wealth on, on uh, oil. And, you know, it's at the top wealth per person in the world, and it looks after its people in an amazing way. Some very uh, subtle and sophisticated thinking on the branding of the country. Um, I'm curious, the brand goes out, it's a message that's, that's communicated to other countries and other people. What do you want them to do? What's the response you want them to have? Yeah, it's a bloody good question. It's, um, yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, well, the last line says, you know, we can do amazing things together. Um, so it's more the, I think this is, I think we could do a lot more with the, the invitation. But it is an invitation to partner. We know that we will not go forward unless we partner for growth. Our growth is going to be inside other people's value chains, more than likely. So we're not going to be owning entire vertically integrated value chains ourselves. We're going to be working inside other people's value chains. And so being able to partner and, and put value into someone else's value chain is really, really huge. So the brand story just says, it says we're more than just a nice country and a bunch of dumb Kiwis. We can think, we've got integrity, you can trust us, and we want to come and work and help create value inside your value chain that will return value to us down here. That's the, So it's, it's the invitation. But I think we're a bit underdone on, on the on the crispness of that and the sharpness of that invitation. I think we've got some more work to do there. Call yeah, call to action. Yeah, yeah right, yeah. right. Yeah, that's a good point. Great. And, and, so and that's, that's a bit the historical milestone here is we actually got a, a story. But we say it's the end of the beginning. So, you know, just, that's just two years' work, just the end of the first phase, so now it's about the sharpness. We think we've got to dial up the edge part of the story. There's a sort of dark, disruptive edge in New Zealand, which we really like, that produces things like Lord or, you know, what are those crazy buggers and that go to, um, to New York and do those songs, what are they called? Um, the, yeah, the cop flight of the guy. I mean, you know, um, or, or, the, or Once Were Warriors. I mean, there's a, there's a dark, disruptive edge uh, that we think is actually a really important part of the story. This is a bit sort of sonorous and a bit tourism still. So, but anyway, end of the beginning, it's a, it's a good step forward and we've got to go forward with a, with a sharper story going forward. Adam. 
something really uh, really came to mind here, which is that you were talking about the um, Brian was talking about the trade-off between um, the environment and uh, and money, basically, right? With agricultural production, and if you're China's farm, that does put you in this unique position um, to drive awareness in China around food quality. And I know that that's growing. A lot of my Chinese friends are very concerned about what they eat and what their families eat. Yeah. And you know, uh, what can the government do here to help um, create not only the brand but also so sort of scientific level certifications oh. around food that's exported to China that that then increases your margins in China. Not only can yeah. you develop the technology to do that and test for that globally, create a new standard for that, but you can also drive your margins up with even demand, uh, driving demand yeah. in China. Yeah. That's something that comes to mind for me. Yeah, and look, um, this is the trick. Um, there's a very, very big difference between food safety and food sustainability. And so you get two different top, the, big, the two big fat market signals we get about food from Europe, uh, Heartland, UK and Germany, or um, the US, Heartland, West Coast, you get, we want, we want there to be a sustainable story in your food. We want to know that you're not wrecking the place where the food came from. It's a very different story in China. In China, we want food that's not going to kill us or make our babies sick. Okay, now... It's actually very technically possible to make very, very safe and good food and wreck the environment. So I think there is a, it's like the, you know, it's a maturity model. And so I think China will get there for sure. But at the moment, sustainability is a luxury for, in, as it appears to us in Chinese demand. So that's, that's why, you know, the, the importance of um, diversifying our markets and pretty much when we're satisfying market pull from, the US, we are driving sustainability stories into New Zealand. When we're satisfying market pull from China, we're driving a cost edge and a, and a food security and safety edge. And they're quite different things. And they, they, there's different economic models. See what I mean? Yeah. Catelyn, you, you had a question? Uh, okay, the point, the point has been made. Hi. Um, so first I want to comment on the message you put out. Um, I've worked on something like 65 different companies and done $2 billion worth of financing and across Ooh. everything. Come and, and spend some money here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, is that um, people often confuse identity with brand. So brand yeah. is the relationship yeah. people have with your identity. And I think mm. is as well stated as I've seen it in the last 20 years. So congratulations on that. But you're asking about how to balance this idea between sustainability and your commerce. Yep. And I just sent an email to Scott Larson at Earthcast. And if you don't know this company, there's an industry to be built here on the value of the data that they've now able to capture. And so they have 10 years worth of low flying data on um, that you can use for agricultural development to look at how the land is changing. You can look at migration patterns. You could look at a thousand different things, they're just providing the data and it's free. So the whole concept of developing farming practices that advance ecological value and um, represent what is truly sustainable, I think is just one path you could pursue. But I'm very sure that there's an entire industry that can be built and exported to the rest yeah. of the world just with that data. Yeah. Earthcast. Yes. I okay. Very cool. Okay. Um, so... Peter has a 1 p.m. in Wellington, and unless we want to provide him a police escort, I think <laughs> I think we should. Even that doesn't work in New Zealand. Yeah, well, I, don't, I don't know. So I'm, we are so humbled and grateful and honoured that you could come out to the middle of this crazy valley to see what we're up to out here, and, and thanks very much for your open mind and open heart. Um, so if we can thank Peter in the way we know him. Oh, well, thank you uh, <clears throat> very, very much for listening. I really appreciate that and for the opportunity to be here. A lot of really amazing people in this room and on an amazing mission and venture and adventure. So uh, good luck and uh, kia kaha. It means stay strong.